quite a bit about the Living Trust and how you can plan with it and determine whether or not this type of planning tool, the Living Trust, is appropriate for you. So let's make a couple of assumptions. Let's assume that John and Mary came to our office and they had a trust created called the Love Family Trust. Now their last name is Love. So we call it the Love Family Trust. So we're going to take a minute and we're actually going to learn what this thing looks like that we call a living trust. And I've got a few little props up front here on the table that I'm going to use. Now you may think they're going to be somewhat elementary, which they are. But if you're like me, you can learn pretty well from touch and feel and sight. I'm kind of visual myself, so perhaps this will help you. Before I can teach you about what a trust is, I need to teach you about what a probate estate is and looks like. And right here is a probate estate. You all have one, and you got one when you were born. So did I. This particular container is dished out to every human being at birth, just like a social security now, social security number is given to, to newborns and put right on their birth certificates. As we grow up and acquire assets, those assets then go into this probate estate, and that's where they're held. And this container just does great for us, frankly, as long as we aren't dead and as long as we aren't disabled. So, we've got two sides of the coin here I'm going to be talking about. Death and disability. Those are the two problems that create havoc with this container. In the event that you die, the law comes along and puts a top on this probate container and locks it down. So, at death, your family members who feel like they can take the will to the court or simply show the will to somebody, a lawyer, they think they can just get the assets out of this container and run off with them. Well, the answer is, unfortunately, no, they can't. They're locked in here, and you have to go where to get the key to this particular container? Where would you have to go? Court. And any time today I start mentioning the word court, I want you to think five to ten thousand dollars minimum. That's about what it costs today just to get in and out of court, even for relatively simple matters. And you're looking at a lawyer that doesn't go to court. That's not what I get up in the morning to do. So I try to keep my clients out of that place as well. Well, we don't want to go to court even though we're going to have to, and even though we have a will. We're going to have to go to court to get the key to open this containers top up so we can get the assets after the person that owned this container died. Once the top is off, then we can get the assets and distribute them to the rightful beneficiaries. The other time in life where a top goes on this container is when you become disabled or let's say incompetent. If you lose your faculties and aren't able to manage your affairs and you haven't figured out how to plan for that, the law comes along with that top again and goes and locks it down. Now we can't pay your bills, we can't manage your investments, we can't sell your property if we needed to. We are simply stuck with the inability to take care of your assets. The family has to go where to get the key to get the top off so they can take care of your stuff to court. When you go to court when someone is disabled or incompetent, the court proceeding is called a conservatorship. And you've probably heard that term, but that's what we need to do. Have a court appoint a family member usually as the conservator through this conservatorship to run the financial show for the disabled or incapacitated family member. 
Money, time, delay, aggravation. About 70% of the folks out here driving around on the streets of Denver don't have any planning done to avoid court. Why? Same reason we avoid so many other things. It's distasteful, it might cost some money to do it, and plus we just procrastinate on things. But what's happening out there is the courts are finding too many cases coming into their courtrooms where they could have simply been avoided had planning been done in advance. So you're going to see how these little tools we use can help you do that. The first tool we use is this one. This right here is another container. This is your revocable living trust. And if you're married, uh, odds are that you'll have one trust for the two of you, or a shared common trust. If you're unmarried, you'll have your own trust. In some cases, depending on the nature of the estate, a husband may have one trust and a wife may have a separate trust. I won't get into the distinctions of why that happens, but for the most part, most trusts are common between husband and wife, and that's what we'll talk about, a common trust for John and Mary Love. The good thing about this particular container, it has a top that is easy to open and close. It actually doesn't require a key from the court to do so. What we would like to do is we would like to use this container as our planning tool because if used properly, it actually is a probate avoidance tool and saves conservatorships as well in the event of our disability. And I want to emphasize this thing about disability in a conservatorship. Most folks don't realize there are two kinds of probates out there in the world. One is the one that we normally think about, that's the one that occurs at death, and we call that a death probate. The second is the living probate, which is the one that occurs if you become incapacitated and don't have your ducks in a row to keep your family from having to go to court to manage your affairs. That's a living probate. And in most cases, that type of living probate is going to be much more time consuming and much more expensive than a death probate. In Colorado, a death probate is relatively simple, although for some reason still relatively expensive. A living probate is still a pretty slow going arduous process because the court gets involved big time in living probates for incapacitated people. So if you're ever thinking about probate, you got to think of both, about both sides of that coin. And the living probate is probably five to ten times more onerous than a death probate. We're going to try to avoid them both. But this trust, as number 15 says, doesn't avoid probate by itself. To work properly, what must John and Mary do with their assets? Absolutely correct. We must retitle them or transfer them to the trust. And we call this process trust funding. So I'm going to describe to you how